Good morning. We'll see if we can get this correct today. We are. Marshall. All right, that's right. We are here to worship the Lord, but we are Marshall as well. So glad that you're here worshiping with us, and we'd love to have a record of your attendance with us today. So if you don't mind to grab the pew pad at the end of the pew there and pass the information to your neighbor seated around you. I have a few things to talk to you about this morning. Um, hopefully you had a chance to join us for Bible study this past Wednesday. And if you did not do that, you have an opportunity to do that the rest of the fall. But also, uh, we're going to be recording my Bible study at least so that you can go back and watch that throughout the week. That's going to be on our Facebook page. We hope to eventually get that to go live. We couldn't get that to go live this past Wednesday. But hopefully in the weeks to come, you'll be able to tune in at home at 630 on Wednesdays and watch the Bible study there as well. The kids in the youth group uh, did have their Bible study as well. And so we're looking forward to that again this Wednesday as well. We hope that you make plans to be with us for our fall farm retreat at the Roberts Farm. That's going to be September 24th. It's going to start at 5 and go till dusk. Uh, we hope that everybody makes a plan to do that with us. Uh, also, in the next couple weeks, we're going to be doing um, a fundraiser for Jericho House. It actually begins today. Uh, there's going to be a benefit concert at Riverlawn Presbyterian Church uh, this afternoon at 3 p.m. All proceeds from that uh, are going to go uh, to the Jericho House. The next one is going to be uh, the following uh, week, or September 25th at 3 at the Methodist, St. Peter's Methodist. And then the final one is going to be at First Baptist on October 16th at 5 p.m. So if you're interested in that, it's going to be a great time. Uh, hopefully you'll be able to join one of, those three, uh, one of those three plans. Also an update on our building fund. We have raised over $11,000. So thank you for, for that and thank you for making your offering to that. We still have a few plans for us to go into the future. Uh, again, we're thrilled that you're here. We have another thing that's special for us today as well. Uh, Jack Rogers is going to come forward and talk to us a little bit about the peacemaking offering in a minute for missions. Good morning. We have the opportunity to do a peace and global witness offering again. We do this annually. Uh, it draws us together as Presbyterians, as peacemakers. It allows us to create resources to deal with conflict and nurturing in support of our global brothers and sisters. You'll be hearing more about this in a couple of weeks, the next couple of weeks. And then in October, uh, we'd like to, to have the donation. The peace of Christ belongs to all people. 25% of this money stays locally. 25% goes to the presbytery for whatever they need to go with other churches to supply the needs. And then 50% is global, which we've always been great supporters of. So I appreciate you listening to me and get out your checkbooks in October. <laughs> give early and give often is what he said. The peacemaking offering is a, is a great offering that we do denominationally. Um, it's something that helps us uh, recognize that Christ's call for us uh, to be peacemakers is an important call from the biblical text. It's also a way for us to help others uh, in the process as they are going to uh, restoration portion of their life. Again, we're thrilled that you're here worshiping with us today. Let's now prepare our hearts to worship the living God.
Good morning. Please join me in the call to worship, Psalm 51. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love. According to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and put me in my spirit. Come, let us worship the triune God. Please join us in our opening hymn, number 318, In Christ There Is No East or West. Time now for the passing of the peace. The peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Our call to confession this morning is from John chapter 2, verse 2. Children of God, I am speaking these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, and he is atoning sacrifice for our sins and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Please join me in the prayer of confession. Merciful God, we continue when we have not loved you our whole heart. We have failed to be an abundant church. We have not done your will in front of your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors. We have refused to hear the cry of those in need. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joy of us in service. Lead us in the ways of love and justice. Jesus Christ, our Lord. Please take a moment for silent confession. Amen. Friends, hear the good news. Who is in a position to condemn us? Only Christ. Yet we know that He came for us, He lived with us, He died for us. 
He rose again to a new life for us and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. The Apostle Paul reminds us that he prays for us. We know that in his coming God was reconciling the world to himself, that our old life was gone and a new life remained. So know that you have been forgiven and be at peace. And pray also for me a sinner. Amen. Be seated. Our Old Testament lesson this morning is from Genesis chapter 15, verses 1 through 6. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision Do not be afraid, Abram, I am your shield. Your reward shall be very great. But Abram said, O Lord God, what will you give me? For I continue childless. And the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. And Abram said, You have given me no offspring, so a slave born in my house is to be my heir. But the word of the Lord came to him, This man shall not be your heir. No one but your very own issue shall be your heir. He brought him outside and said, Look toward heaven and count the stars. If you are able to count them, then he said to him, So shall your descendants be. And he believed the Lord, and the Lord reckoned it to him as righteousness. The word of the Lord. May be seated. And at this time, I invite the children forward for a children's sermon. All righties. Okay, so I have a question for us today. What does anybody know what today is? Nine eleven, and what is nine eleven? The day that our country was attacked, right? We had planes that crashed into the big, tall buildings, and we had another plane that crashed into the Pentagon, and it was a long time ago, wasn't it, right? None of you were born when that happened. In fact, my son, who's 21, was just a wee little baby. He had just been born a few months before it happened. And so it's a weird day for us because we, we make a special note of it, and we say this is an important day for us, but it's also a really sad day because a lot of people got hurt that day, right? But one of the things that we have to, to do, and people say this a lot on 9-11, they say, never forget. And so when you never forget, what else are you doing? Are you doing anything? Are you, you're remembering exactly, right? So we're remembering that day that was a tragic day. And so kind of like when we come to church, on every Sunday that we come to church, we are celebrating, we are remembering, we're not forgetting that Jesus died for us. Did you know that? Every Sunday is a little mini Easter. Now Easter is a fun day, right? What happens on Easter? You get a little chocolate on Easter, right? Do you all like chocolate? Everybody likes chocolate. Yes, of course. Okay. So, but we don't get chocolate today, right? We don't get something special today because it's not, it's not like a holiday, but it is a day that's really important for us to remember. And so God always kind of gives us these things throughout our life that are like mileposts, they're journey markers that say, this was an important day. Our whole Bible is filled 
with a bunch of things that we should never forget, that we should always remember. The most important thing is that God loves us and God has a plan for us and God wants to use us to be awesome people, okay? To help others and to love other people. So we're going to thank God uh, for this day that we have. We're going to ask God to help us never forget, but also have God help us be great people in the future, okay? So let's pray. Repeat after me. Dear God, you rock, and we love you. And we're so glad we have this church that's a safe place for all of us. Help us never to forget what happened on September 11th. And also for your love that you died for us on the cross. Help us love other people and be people who extend grace. We love you. Amen. Okay, go sit down. Oh, guess what? I forgot. Again, even though I set out the offering, we're supposed to go collect the sensibility. Okay, walk around. They're going to put change in that for us, and we're going to use that to help other people, okay? So go, go collect change, and then bring it back up here. Okay, bring them back up here. Awesome. Okay, good job. Thank you, ladies. I invite you to turn with me to Luke's Gospel, chapter 12. We're going to be reading verses 32 through 40 today. A few weeks ago, you probably, I don't know if you remember this or not, but I said, we're not reading what everybody else is reading because of what I did. I messed up back in the spring. And so I got us off kilter with the lectionary a little bit, but I said, don't worry, there will be a day when I catch us up. Today is that day when I catch us up. Okay. So we're going to look at Luke 12 verses 32 through 40. Hear God's holy word. Do not be afraid, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions and give alms. Make purses for yourselves and do not wear out. And an unfailing treasure in heaven where no thief comes near nor, nor no moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Be dressed for action and have your lamps lit. Be like those who are waiting for their master to return from the wedding banquet so that they may open the door for him as soon as he comes and knocks. Blessed are those slaves whom the master finds alert when he comes. Truly I tell you, he will fasten his belt and have them sit down to eat, and he will come and serve them. If he comes during the middle of the night or near dawn and finds them, so blessed are those slaves. But know this, if the owner of the house had not known at what hour the thief was coming, he would not have let his house be broken into. You must be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an un unexpected hour. May the Lord add blessing and understanding to the reading and hearing of His Holy Word. Let us pray. Holy and gracious God, we thank You for Your story and for Your text, and we ask God that You would give us a piece of Your understanding this day. We say these things in the name of Your Son, Jesus. Amen. I'm willing to bet that I know the answer to this, but... I'll ask it nonetheless. Um, has anyone ever heard of the pitch drop experiment? The pitch, P-I-T-C-H drop. In 1929, 
Uh, there was an Australian physicist and professor at the University of Queensland. His name was Thomas Parnell, and he proposed a theory. And his theory was a substance that looks like it is solid happens to, in fact, be liquid. And so to prove his theory, he heated up uh, a, a sample of tar pitch and poured it into a sealed funnel. And so he let this pitch settle um, for quite some time. Uh, I, think it, I think it was like two years. I can't remember if I wrote it in here or not. He let it sit for two years, yes. And at the end of those two years, he cut the bottom of the funnel off and allowed the pitch to what he thought was going to happen, let it drain. Uh, so the stem was cut, and from that day on, the pitch has dripped out of that funnel at a rate of one drop every about eight years. Okay? So after eight years, uh, Mr. Parnell completely missed it. Uh, they had set a, a timer to try to time exactly how many years this would take or how long it would take, but his theory of solid viscosity uh, was finally proven when after 16 years, the second part of the pitch dropped. Now, I know how hard it is to wait like a day for what you hope comes in the mail or something like that, right? But to wait for eight years for something you think is going to happen to happen, and then to make it be proven, wait an additional eight years would be, I think, remarkably difficult, right? Does anybody agree with that? That's hard to wait on something that long. So imagine those eight years of walking in the hallway with your other colleagues, the other physicists. Hey, is it dropped yet? Hey, hey, is it moving? Right? I mean, nothing's happening. You can't really report on that. Waiting is something that all of us have to do, and my guess is none of us enjoy waiting. Is that a fair assessment? None of us enjoy waiting. Well, however long we do have to wait in life, I've done some averages for us, and so I'm just going to throw some things that these are the ways that we have to wait on a normal basis. Over the span of a normal American's lifetime, we wait two weeks Two weeks of our life is spent waiting at red lights. We spend two to three years of our life waiting in line at banks, at the DMV. At the DMV is kind of obvious, right? I mean, that's a very long, it's a very long wait there. We spend, I love this, this is like true American, right? So two years waiting in line. But we, since we spend 16.25 years of our life waiting on pizza alone, right? So that's how much pizza we eat and how long it takes us to wait for our pizza to be picked up, 16.25 years. Tom Petty, one of my favorite artists ever, I think has a great philosophical statement. The waiting is the hardest part, right? The waiting is the hardest part. And I think that's the framework for us today, for the gospel message, the waiting of our promise from God, for that promise to come. Now, we've backed up a little bit in Luke. We've gone back to chapter 12, as I mentioned a bit just a few minutes ago. But the setting is still the same. He still has these large crowds that are following him. He still has uh, people that want to listen to what he has to say. This, um, today's election kind of fits right after the parable of the rich fool, who tears down houses to build more. We preached about that uh, back in August. And so that story kind of leads into this story about waiting and planning and anxiety. The nations worry about these things, God would say. Don't worry about food or clothing or where that's going to happen. God will provide for you. And so then that part of that lection is followed by today. The dominant culture uh, kind of feeds this myth of, of scarcity, that there's not enough for everybody to have something, and so we have to gather as many things as we need to, right? That the selfishness of that rich fool who has all the storehouses to store all of his things, but he tears those down, wastes all that material that he has saved in order to build more. And I think it's a beginning of a changed worldview 
that Christ is giving us in these teachings, right? So if we have ever watched a show on TV, have you ever seen the, like the prepper shows on television, right? So people think that doomsday is coming, and so they buy like hordes and hordes and hordes of food, and they build, uh, they build bunkers and things like that in their yard. I don't, I don't, I just don't think that would ever work. We have, uh, we got scared once when the pandemic first hit, and so a guy gave us this box of like pasta that you can rehydrate. It has dehydrated meat and stuff like that in it. And now we've just moved it around the garage so many times. We're not, I don't even know what we'll ever do with it. And I think probably in my lifetime, uh, looking at what privileged people do um, when a tragedy happens, for me, uh, was when the cruise ship uh, back, I think this was 2013 or 14, a cruise ship broke down in the Gulf of Mexico. Does anybody remember this story? So they lost power, and within hours, within almost minutes of that cruise ship losing power, what happened? Do you remember what happened? The place went like Lord of the Flies. People had broken into the refrigerated areas of the, of the ship. They were stealing food. They were knocking each other over. People died aboard that cruise ship. There was a woman that got, like, ran over. She was in a wheelchair. She got turned over. All because a cruise ship lost power for, like, a day. Right? So imagine those of us who call ourselves Christian... We've been waiting on Christ's return for nearly 2,000 years now. What have we done that may seem cosmically crazy for waiting this long? Jesus encourages his listeners at the beginning of our text saying, Do not be afraid, little flock. The reason he has this to say, Don't fear, is your father took pleasure... The Greek word there is eudoko. It doesn't really translate into another great English word, but eudoko means that he has formed you with intent. He has already promised to give you the kingdom. And it, the, the, the word that kind of comes to mind in, in Greek, actually, when this word is used is uh, it seemed too good to do. Like this thing that God has said will happen, this gift that you're going to receive, it seems too good for God to do that. So God actually took pleasure in promising us this gift. In God's kingdom as it is in heaven and on earth, there is no scarcity. There is not a scarcity of food. There's not a scarcity of human dignity. And you know what's fascinating about this? Jesus says that God has already accomplished this giving of God's kingdom. It's freely given to us. It's already something that we have inherited. We just don't possess it quite yet. But because of that, Jesus says this kind of odd thing to us. Sell your possessions and give alms. Now, this is a sign that the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Do you want to pay God back for this splendid gift of abundance? It's a healthy way to live in a cause that endures forever. But really, is that the response? Do we we give to the poor only because God has gifted us or because it's the right thing to do? We don't do it to impress God. We give alms to the weakest and most vulnerable, and we do that because we believe and we trust and know that Christ has given something to us. It's not a tally mark that we check off. Christ really says here, do these things. Do this. Do this as a part of your conventional wisdom. Do this without hoping to to reap a benefit, and do it certainly without complaint or judgment. In the words of Nike, just do it. Make money purses for yourselves that do not become old, an unfailing treasure in the heavens where no thief comes or moth destroys. If one's treasure has been kept to oneself, one's treasure is always at risk. But if one's treasure has been given to the poor, it is unfailing. 
Our texts are often tied to a life learning. It's something that's a challenge for us. It's not supposed to be easy, but it's supposed to maybe be a bit reassuring. You're going to be waiting to reap the benefit of what God promises you, but in the meantime, are you waiting to be served, or are you waiting to serve? Christ would call us to be waiting to serve. Beginning with Abraham, God said, start walking in a direction, and I'm going to give you a land that you don't know exists before you get there. Then in our text for today, he says, your descendants will be as the stars in the sky. How many descendants did Abraham and Sarah actually get to see? Well, we know that they had uh, Ishmael, which wasn't Sarah's, and they had Isaac, which was. But how many grandchildren, how many great-grandchildren did they get to experience in life? They certainly didn't get to experience the multitude of Israelites that left Egypt, that left that enslavement, and came back to the land that God had given to Abraham originally. And their waiting was horrific. 400 years of slavery in Egypt. 400 years of slavery in Egypt before those descendants could realize the promise that God gave to Abraham. And it's pretty hard to say to a group of people who have been enslaved their entire lives, who have been mistreated and who have been abused, now, now you say, God loves you and we're going we're gonna to go away to this place that God's promised you. It's your kingdom. This promised land, this land flowing with milk and honey. Any of us that know the story of the Exodus know it did not always go as Moses planned, did it? No. <laughs> In fact, it probably went ways that it never should have gone. But nonetheless, God's promise remained true. And God's timing has a great deal to do with most of what we experience in both the First Testament and the Second Testament. In Greek, those words that we would use to, to translate as time are chronos and kairos. Have you ever heard of those two terms, chronos and kairos? So chronos is the time that when we, like when we measure time, we would say, you know, like now it's 11 or it's 10, 34, okay? That's chronos time, chronology, how we, how we measure time. But God's timing, kairos, is the time that is governed by God. The Bible tells us that God created the heavens and the earth. Science tells us that that creation took billions of years. And yet here we are today. So in God's kairos, in God's timing, how long it took the universe to form was billions of years. If you put our human lifespan, the time in history where we know humans have existed on earth, compared to the length of time the universe has been in existence, it's like the tip of a toothpick compared to the rest of time. We've not made up that much time, but we believe that God created this as a place for humanity, that we were created as a gift from God to God, that we are God's own people, created in God's image. But if we were to ever ask anything about what happens in God's timing, we can say it takes a long time for God's will to be done. So doing things in God's timing... Doing things that suit God's eternal purpose, we have to wait for that to happen. So the question for all of us is, do we trust God's timing? Do we then have faith, is the way we could ask that question. If you really want to know what faith is, it's trusting in God's timing. Not leaving things to our own hands, our own will, but trusting in God's timing. So then the question we have to ask ourselves is this, can we serve under those circumstances? The point is that God is with us and our work and our lives and through our own lives is important because it benefits the realm of God before it does for ourselves. 
To go back to that experiment, in 93 years of this experiment, nine drops of pitch have fallen from that container. It's still going on. You can go to the university's website and, and look at this pitch that will not fall while you're watching it, right? You'll, you'll not believe that it's actually a liquid. Kind of tragedy hit a few years ago. The ninth drop formed uh, in 2000, the beginning of 2013. Everyone thought it was going to fall that year. I didn't really make the news, but, but people that care about this watched it, right? Uh, it's not really something that Mark's going to report on later, I don't think, right? The pitch falling. But uh, the tragedy struck in 2014. So everyone assumed that this pitch drop was going to fall in 2013. It didn't. On April 17th, the ninth pitch drop touched the eighth pitch drop, which means there were a few more months for it to actually separate from the top and the bottom. But they noticed that if they let that pitch drop settle, that would be the last time they could do this experiment. So they said, we think we have time to change the jar. And so one week after the touch took place, the jar was being moved, the bell was being lifted off of it, and a little piece of wood that was holding everything together evidently wobbled, and this solid piece of pitch broke off. The first time in 93 years <laughs> that they had messed up the experiment in hopes to make this experiment continue going into the future. <laughs> like I said, if you want to catch a glimpse of it, they hope that the 10th drop will fall this year, so you can go with bated breath to the website and watch that. What kind of excites me about this story is I think that that pitch drop is a Presbyterian uh, because it takes a long time to make a decision, right? Am I going to fall? Am I going to hang around a little longer, right? It's like it's formed a committee to make a decision. And I wonder what it was like when the first people said, in looking at this space in St. Albans and saying, we think a church needs to be built here. And I wonder those people that said, we're going to build this church. It's going to be the first Presbyterian church in St. Albans. We'll spend some time later coming up with a name for it. But for now, let's call it the first Presbyterian church of St. Albans, right? Do you think that they would have thought about any of us sitting here right now? Do you think that they would thought of the millions of dollars over the last 150 years or so that's been sent in missions aid? Do you think that they would have thought about any times that we've wondered about changing the color of carpeting or paint, right? All of the things that we've struggled to understand in this place. Can we help in this situation? Can we help in that situation? How many times is this church going to have to go through a pandemic? They would have never guessed once, nor would they have guessed twice. But in the span of this church being around, we've had two global pandemics that have affected how people worship here. My message for us this day is Christ's kingdom is all about progressive patience. We can't be stuck solidly someplace, unwilling to move to a new idea or a new thought. But it may take us a while to get to the place to make those decisions about where we think God is calling us to be. Our waiting and our working has prepared us to be a place where we can be a house of worship, we can be a house of prayer, and we can be a place that looks beyond our walls to say, how, Lord, will you use us to help you? May we never see the effect that patient progress has on us, but may we all realize the progressive patience that Christ has given us to be this place in this world. Let us embrace a challenge. Let us be a church that is unsatisfied with stagnation and static existence. Let us clamor for progress with open minds, with renewed spirits, however long that may take and may be. And let us do all that in the name of the Father and the Son 
and the Holy Spirit. Amen and amen. Now let us stand and declare that which we believe in the recitation of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born to the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. At this time, we are going to continue our worship by the giving of our tithes and offerings. Let us pray. Holy and gracious God, we thank you so much for the many gifts and blessings that you have given to us in this life. Lord, as we return a portion of these gifts to you, we ask for your wisdom, for your courage to use these gifts in a manner in which you see fitting. All this we say in the name of your Son, Jesus. Amen. You may be seated. I have a note here from uh, Jennifer Burgess. Uh, please pray for Dan Burgess, uh, who is Denny's twin. He was diagnosed with lung cancer this week, and so be mindful of them. I'm certain that many of you have requests and praises as well. Let us bind all those together and lift those to our Lord and to our King. Let us pray. Holy and gracious God, we come to you this day thankful, Lord, for everything in life that we experience the way that we have this cosmos, Lord, that you have created. We thank you, Lord, for that gift. We thank you, God, for the way that we have each other, the camaraderie, the friendship, the familial ties. Lord, we thank you for the gift of other. And on this day, Lord, we're mindful that just over two decades ago, our land was shaken to its core. There was fear and there was frustration. Lord, we ask that that day 
be a day that we never forget, Lord, but also that we never have to experience again. And we pray that prayer not only for ourselves, Lord, but for the world. We're heartbroken, Lord, when we see pictures of war and oppression, the foul leadership gone awry. We're heartbroken, Lord, when your children, when the citizens of this world suffer. We pray for a day, Lord, where there is no longer a need for there to be a standing army or navy. But until that time, Lord, we're also thankful for the women and men who have said yes to defending our country, to help us remain free, who are willing to travel to foreign and distant lands to defend us. We pray, Lord, for our president, for the leaders of our nations, our state and local leaders. We pray, Lord, wherever someone governs, that you would be patient with them and encourage them, Lord, with your spirit and your still small voice. We pray for peace. In this season of peacemaking, Lord, we pray for peace. God, we're also thankful for the gift that you give us in being able to assist in your kingdom coming. We thank you, Lord, for this responsibility to serve in your dear name. We pray, Lord, that you would be patient with us as we learn to live a life of faith. Encourage us, Lord, and give us strength to serve in your dear name. We're mindful of those, Lord, who have lost a loved one recently. We're mindful, Lord, of those who have said goodbye to a friend, a family member, a pet. We ask, God, that you would be with them in their grief and their mourning. We're mindful, God, also of those who need for you to be the great physician. We're thankful, Lord, for the healers that you have given us, for those that are rushing to the aid and assistance of those in need. We ask, God, that you would heal us and make us whole, strengthen us, invigorate us to tackle this world, Lord, with love and grace and peace and hope. Because we are a community of faith, we pray for those who are seated to our right and to our left, in front of us and behind us. And in the stillness of this moment, Lord, we pray for ourselves. We thank you so much, Lord, for the grace that your Son has extended to us in his life and sacrificial death and resurrection. We are amazed by that grace, Lord, and the glory of your ways. We thank you for sending your Son, that he showed us how to live and taught us also to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Please stand as you're able for our closing hymn, hymn number 626, As the Deer. We're going to sing through that twice.
you know, sometimes it's hard for us to remember what it's like to, to have a childlike wait, a childlike anticipation, right? Our kids just started uh, back to school and, you know, they're looking forward, I hope still, <laughs> to what the school year will offer them. Hopefully they're not ready for it to be over just yet. Uh, but there's, there's this part of, of just awaiting the unknown, right? Not knowing who your teacher is going to be, not knowing what child is going to be in your classroom, what friend from a previous year. We don't know what those things are like. As adults, we wonder, how long is it going to take for me to pay off this car? Or how long is it going to take to pay off this house or this credit card? Whatever those things are. But when that finally happens, think about the celebration that occurs. And that's the way that I anticipate God's kingdom coming into full fruition. We've been waiting and waiting and waiting for this for so long that it almost becomes like we forgot that it's coming. We forgot to anticipate, to have that joy of what it's like to be ushered in to God's kingdom. But as Christians, we have that hope and we live by the faith that it will occur. And it's not like having to watch tar pitch drop out of a jar for eight years, right? We get some more, each, each day can be a glimpse into what it is that Christ gives us as a promise of his kingdom come. But what it would it be like if each of us was a mirror of that promise to the world? <laughs> that our job, our responsibility as a Christian is to go into this world and to be a portion of what drops for somebody else. So that we could be something that is witness to the resurrection of Christ. I believe that's what we're actually called to be. And so let's try to do that together. Amen? Amen. Now receive the blessing of the triune God, the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. May he be with us all until we meet again either here or his glorious kingdom come. Amen and amen. Happy Sunday. And go Steelers. Amen.